My name is Patrick Venetia, so as uh, the previous speaker said, I come from Ireland, but the accent is French, so you know, you ask, excuse me for that. And uh, today I would just want to tell you a bit more about games, game-based learning in particular. And what I want to do is just to make a link between games and health. Today we have a fantastic opportunity for both practitioners, doctors, surgeons, nurses, but also game developers, game designers, to get together to network and to learn more about each other. So, uh, what I try to do is just to give some information to all of you. I think there are some students here, professors. Um, I just want to have a, just a, head, a brief head count right now. Uh, who is a student here? Just raise your hand. Okay, so about a third and quarter. So I think we are, is it multimedia, is that correct? Multimedia? Perfect. So I'll try to get some information for you in there, alright? What I try to do for you is to uh, give you some pointers about the different software devices you might use in your study and some literature what you might use in your thesis. Um, I think we have some doctors here, just raise your hand. Doctors, one, two, okay. Okay, very few of them. That's fine, don't worry, it's okay. Um, <laughs> we won't bite you. Um, for doctors, I believe that some of you might know games, some of you might not. So what this presentation will do is that I will introduce you to video games. I will tell you exactly what games are, what you can do, what you cannot do with them, and how basically you may be able to use them to heal patients, to help uh, train doctors, and so forth. Okay? So we have doctors, we have students. Is there any researchers around here as well? Maybe PhD or master's by research? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. One. Just one. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's still okay. So again, for you, uh, as a researcher, uh, I will try to give a presentation toward giving you some information, uh, literature, for instance, some references, and uh, maybe uh, again some references to software disease history, just something that you can use in your study. All right. So, um, just to summarize this, the, the, the different items that we covered in my presentation, I will explain how games can be used to teach, to learn, and to train. I will identify different challenges and opportunities. All of us have different challenges, uh, and some of them actually can be, I suppose, we can actually complement each other. For instance, for doctors, I believe that one of the main issues is to uh, prevent um, some health issues or to train um, new uh, recruits. For game developers, we might have some, sorry, we might have some other issues, such as knowing exactly what topic to develop our video games with, and also maybe the ability to communicate with professionals to provide a video game that is both educational and motivational. So, what you will take from this, from this keynote, as I said, um, I will give you an overview of the field of game-based learning. Have you heard about game-based learning before? Just raise your hand if you have. Okay, perfect. Can you just, anyone can just give me a, just a very simple or broad definition of what they think game based learning is? Just, just a very broad definition. Anyone? It's for, for education, for example, to, to have some uh, kind of serious things which are used to, to transport knowledge to, yeah. to a student. Or yeah, I agree. Knowledge. So we have knowledge. What else? What, do you, what other element of game based learning do you think? What, Fit into game based learning, yes? Fun. Sorry? Fun. Okay, so fun, knowledge, what else? Individualize. Individualize, very good, so we'll have a look at that as well. So fun, knowledge, individualize, what else? Change of behavior. Behavior, I think that's very important. Okay, so we have four elements here. Um, knowledge, I think knowledge is important, in fact, knowledge is a change of behavior. Okay. When you know something, when you get to know something, you just change your behavior. You change what you think something is, right? We talk about fun in the back, in the, in the back there. Fun is very important, as well as when we use games. Individualization. Why do you think it's important to individualize a software or a game? What do you think it is? Any idea? Okay, we're going to go right later. We are all different type of people. We have different motivation. We talk about intrinsic motivation and strength motivation. So we are motivated by different things. 
the issue that you have let's say, for doctors is to motivate some patients to do their physiotherapy, for instance, or rehabilitation exercise, but sometimes you just can't find the right way to motivate them because we all have different type of internal and intrinsic motivation. And that's something that's very important in two games. So when you look at motivation, we look at individualization. And by individualization, we talk about motivation, but also about differences in terms of abilities or disabilities. We want to develop software for everyone that are inclusive. So with people who have um, different types of disabilities, could be visual impairments, could be a physical um, uh, restrictions or issues and so forth. So that's what we want to do. We want to include everyone. So, uh, as I said, for PhD students, you will hopefully have some references for your study. For medical doctors, an explanation of why and how you make most of your video games for uh, the healing process and training. And you have, do we have some medical technology engineer here? Maybe, maybe not. So, anyway, if they get this presentation after online, they'll be able to get some information from it. Okay? So, about this conference, the first thing about this conference, I think it's a, it's a very, very uh, good conference. It's an outstanding conference with international output from Germany, from Denmark, I believe, and a very good opportunity to meet and to network on the topics of games that they have. The first thing, the second thing is a commitment to research and development. Uh, this project has produced some very interesting output already and will in the future, I believe. And the last thing is that we have very, very interesting innovative projects at the forefront of game-based learning on research and patient safety, simulation, rehabilitation and learning. So I just want to first thing to congratulate Felix uh, for the organization of this conference and of course uh, the other organizers who are um, Francisca and Pallier, if I remember well, so I just want to congratulate them. So if you can just give them a round of applause just to congratulate them on the conference. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, of course, during this conference, we have different topics. Uh, you will have presentations, you will have keynotes, obviously. Also, uh, showcases with the back there, if you haven't tried it. Uh, there is actually a really nice application to test uh, your motor abilities. So please just go at the back if you want to just test them. It's quite interesting just to get a feel of what you can do with game-based learning. So it's nice, you have a bit of theory, but you also have a bit of practice as well, so you can link the two of them. Um, now, uh, just to let you know a bit more about what I do, my profile, my background is, uh, is in game-based learning. So I have an MSc in multimedia technologies, I have my PhD in game-based learning, and I just want user modeling, the idea to individualize a video game based on people's personalities. And uh, I'm also the editor chief of a journal called the International Journal of Game-Based Learning. It's a journal that started last year, and we have really interesting papers on a broad type of topic, but all linked to game-based learning. By learning, uh, we, we talk about training, motivation, engagement, and so forth. Okay, I will give you the link at the end of this presentation. And of course, I'm interested, and I do some research in game-based learning. What I also do is I, I work with schools, and what I use, I use video games to uh, get students to get to develop an interest in programming and sciences in general. So what we did last year, for instance, we had a summer school, and we had a student to create a video game, and we got some students who didn't know anything about uh, developing to create a game using a, a game engine called Game Maker. Have you heard about Game Maker before? Maybe? Okay. You can see some developers there. It's a very simple video game engine, but you can actually do, do, uh, do quite a few things with it. And last but not least, I uh, organized some conferences and symposia on game based learning. Two of them will be in Ireland next year, so if you've never seen Ireland, it's a lovely country. I would advise you just to have a look at it. Uh, the first one is called IGBL, it will be in June. And the next one is called ECGBL, it's the European uh, Conference on Game Based Learning. It will be in October. Now, a few challenges that we face. So, what I want to do first is just to summarize in terms of challenges. As a researcher, one of the challenges that I'm facing is <coughs> to find a model to develop, to develop video games to combine both learning and engagement. That's one of the main issues we have as researchers in game-based learning. One of the problems we face is that sometimes the game is fun, but we don't learn much from it. And sometimes the game is very educational, but we don't have much fun with it. 
That's the issue that we faced 20, 30 years ago. Now we're trying to bridge this gap, probably because there is more interaction between game designers and educational uh, developers. And one of the other things we're trying to look at is the factors that underpin the perfect or effective design of video games. Now, before I go to this slide, I just want to look at doctors or practitioners, and I just want you to let me know what kind of issues you'd like to solve, and you think you could solve with games. So if you have any doctors around here, I just want you to raise your hand just to let me know what you think you expect from this conference. Any doctor yet? Yeah. Um, there is one there, you want to get this mic? Actually, what do I expect? I want to learn and uh, to understand, try to understand uh, how you work and what is possible. And uh, what I believe what you have to learn is that you understand our difficulties we have and our problems from a clinical point of view. Yes. Because in, in medicine, particularly if you are a surgeon as I am, then it's a clear concept you are following. And uh, if you want to approach a patient from a different side, it's a complete new issue. We have to learn it. You have to see it and you have to learn it and the patient, of course, finally, is the object that has to learn it. And this is something that is very interesting, so I'm expecting a very lively discussion about the various standpoints, because it's always interesting when you look at one problem from two different sides. Yes, that's the idea. Very good. Uh, who else want to talk? Maybe you want to tell us what kind of issues they are facing as practitioners? No? No? Yeah, maybe not. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so I've, I've listed some issues that you might face as practitioners. The first one is training in realistic yet safe environments. From the literature, it just seems that basically, it's if you're a surgeon, for instance, or if you work in emergency services, you like, some people just want to practice. The only thing is, well, if you want to practice on real patients, you get only one shot. Okay, you can't really mess it up. But the problem is you want, some people want to practice. So the first thing is practice in a realistic and safe environment. The second thing is learn by doing and learn from mistakes. Um, I believe, and I'm a fair believer, that you learn by, me, by making mistakes. So, and there is, there is something, there was someone say that the more mistakes you make, the more you learn. Because obviously you make a mistake, you learn why you made them, and then obviously you try to, to change things around. The third thing is being able to palliate for the increase in skills by updating knowledge frequently. Some papers in the interview just say that people who work in the emergency services, for instance, one of the issues that they have is that their skills might decrease over time. And there, is two, there are two issues with that. First thing, self-assessment. Sometimes they might not be able to self-assess their skill, which means that they might not be able to know exactly if they are top of their game or not. That's the first thing. And the second thing, how do you get them to train frequently? Or do you motivate them to train frequently? That could be an issue. And the last bit is combining critical thinking with psychomotor skills in an emotionally realistic environment. To train with a piece of paper and so forth under no pressure is fine. But what you want is something realistic. You want to be, to be actually trained with stress to environment. Now maybe not all the time, but you want to be as close as possible to the situation. And the issue with some of the uh, training software we have at the moment, let's see if it's e-learning for instance, it's fine to learn with broad memory, but first it doesn't engage your skills any better, and second, your emotions, you're not trained to react or to manage your emotions, which is called emotional intelligence. But it's something that's quite important. And other points, communicate and explain sensitive condition to patients. If you look at the review of the literature, for instance, you might see that um, one of the main issues that people have is to communicate with patients, or patients to communicate about their conditions to their peers, but also to professionals. And that's something that uh, we need to solve. Now, as you, see, you will see later, some games have already managed to do that, right? especially for post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. And um, again, you have the, the issue with diag uh, diag uh, diagnose, to diagnose some conditions, a patient to talk about their condition, and to seek for help and start treatment. Later on, I'm going to tell you about the game, and it's called um, it's House Hero. And what you do with people what you have post traumatic disorders play these video games. And what we seems, what it seems for the interior review and from the, the result, is that 
this game helped them not only to diagnose their issues, their, their condition, sorry, but also to communicate their condition to other peers and so forth. So it's something that with video games we can do. We can manage to do so, especially with role-playing games, because role-playing games are video games that allow you to see a product from different perspectives. From the patient's perspective, from the, the doctor's perspective, and from the peer's perspective. So the idea is that you can see the problem from a lot of different perspectives. So, I think as practitioners uh, in the health and healthcare sector, we need at least five things. First, to inform, so the idea of knowledge. The second thing, to change behaviors, as uh, was highlighted uh, by some of them here and there. Uh, we need to engage people. We need to support learning, reflection, and progress. And we need to reach people. Now, what we see also is that, have you heard about digital immigrants, digital natives? I think some of you in the master will have known about it. The idea is that we have a new generation of students who are quite used to digital media and we need to reach them, we need to get this information to them. The only problem is that with traditional methodologies, sometimes it might be quite difficult to motivate them. So the idea is that maybe with video games, we might manage to do so. So, game-based learning, GBM, or promising, a promising field. So, that's the, the whole idea of digital natives that I, I, I told you about before. Uh, people are just, okay, um, I'm not sure if you're, if, are some of you teaching here? Are you some of you teaching in university or? Okay. Do you ban or do you allow mobile phones in the, in the classroom? It's bad. Okay, anyone else? Ban, ban, okay. Now, that's one of the points I was making, but it, it depends on the situation, right? But most of the time, mobile phones are, see, are seen as a nuisance, as a problem rather than a solution. And you will see in game based learning, mobile phones are actually used to teach. They are used to motivate people, to play video games, to do research, to what is called problem based learning or inquiry, inquiry based learning. And the idea is that you use any of the digital tools to help students learning. I can understand in some situations it could be a problem, especially if you're talking and so forth, but you can use mobile phones to actually engage them. You can use mobile phone to, to let them learn. Um, now, I like this question, <laughs> just to illustrate the point about digital native and digital immigrants. Um, you do my website and I do your homework. Okay? That's the dad talking to his kid. The other one is his kid, looks a bit lost. And he said, there are many icons to click, uh, it's a short call. So basically, there are some digital technologies that are looking for people to click, but you can't, all right? <laughs> so we just illustrate that nowadays, um, we need to change the way we teach. And one of those, of course, is to use video games, but to use digital media. I think it's, uh, it's a necessity. Now, there are a few quotes that I like. The first one is called, without play, education becomes a force of compliance not intelligence. Anyone wants to, to actually comment on that? Do you agree or disagree? Do you think it applies to what you're doing? Okay, just raise your hand if you agree. Okay, just raise your hand if you disagree. <laughs> okay, you just want to be seeing yeah. Okay, so what it means is that Ducaste in 2003, she wrote a good few publications about games, digital media, and she actually specialized as well in the idea of gender difference in video games. But what she said is that you can't push knowledge into someone's head. Well, you can't, it just doesn't really work. You need to motivate them, you need to engage them, you need to contextualize your knowledge as well. And the other idea after the castle, uh, there is another slide just after that, is that usually learning should be a pleasurable activity. Okay, and that's from James Corby. I'm sure those material students will have known about this guy there. And do you know about this guy, James Corby? Okay, I wrote a really nice book about what you can learn from video games. And what he says is that learning the deep human needs, like mating and eating, like all such needs, it is meant to be deeply pleasurable to human beings. So you can't disconnect learning and pleasure. That's, to me, it doesn't really make sense. You need to be motivated, you need to be engaged, you need to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't, then you will not learn as much. All right? So uh, that's something that's something quite interesting. It applies to uh, training and learning in general. Now, 
The idea behind that is that we need to, to use fun. So that's the idea of today. You know, different, the fun different end we saw this morning about fun, learning, behavior, and so forth. We need to include a bit more fun into our activities. And the idea of video games is that you can not only uh, include fun into video games, but video games, when you look at learning theories, video games include a lot of different aspects of learning theories. Now, who has a learning background, e-learning background? Concept, yeah? Okay. So you might be familiar with problem-based learning, and problem-based learning, and with Koski and so forth. Does it ring the bell? I'm sure, I'm sure you maybe you sure you, I'm sure you read with, with a different uh, accent to start with, and, and a different uh, a background. Problem-based learning? Yeah. Yes, okay. So the idea, for instance, of problem-based learning is that to learn, you are given a problem, and you will solve it, you will solve it using different steps. If you look at video games, it's the exact same thing. If I want to get to the, the end of the first level, I need to solve a problem. Either by killing the, uh, the monster at the end, or jumping across different gaps and so forth. But I need to solve a problem. And that's the idea of problem based learning. If you look at inquiry based learning, it's the idea to collect clues and so forth in order to find a solution to a problem. If you look at a role playing game or adventure game, it's the exact same principle. You discuss with all the characters, you collect items, and you find you find you solve your problem. Now, there is a concept that is quite interesting in games as well. It's called the concept of zone of proximal development, and it's the idea that people become more and more independent in their learning. But to become independent in their learning, they have what is called a more knowledgeable order. So someone will help them. In video games, it happens in terms of the game itself, can help you, but you can also use play social games. In fact, okay, who has played, who is on Facebook? Facebook? Okay. So have you played maybe Farmville? Yes? Don't be, don't be, okay. Have you played, have you played Farmville already? No? Maybe? Okay, maybe it's a taboo, so I won't ask. Uh, <laughs> but the idea is that, you have a lot of different video games out there that promote learning. You don't learn it on your own, but you learn with people. Let's see if you look at um, online games, let's say role playing games or uh, MMORPGs, which are games where many people from all over the world can play online. You will play by learning from them. They will show you if you have a problem, you can ask them, they will show you how to do it, and so forth. So, video games you can play, you can learn in a lot of different ways. Now, there is also another concept, which is called the concept of flow. And I think it applies to games, it applies to health as well. Have you heard about flow before? Yes. Yes. Can you give me an idea of what you think is flow is yet? Yeah, it's, um, as a, this picture shows, it is between the boredom and the anxiety that you have a yeah. perfect level of um, yeah, um, activity. Yeah. That is not, uh, it, it matches the skill level, mm -hmm. it's not too high that you um, uh, it's, it's too difficult for you, but it's yeah. not um, too easy that it goes to board. So it's a perfect level that matches your skills as you feel entertained. Okay. You said it? That's it? That's the idea? Okay, so the idea of flow is that you have challenge enough so that it's reachable, so that you can manage your, your, your goal, but it's at a level that just keeps you challenged all the time. So you, you make your, it's, it's not too far away, so you can still reach it, but it's just keeping you on your toes. Basically, if, if you want to summarize it, it just keeps you on your toes. But the idea of the, of the flow challenge is that you're so focused in your activity that despite the challenges ahead, you stick to it. And I think that's what we need to achieve. When you talk about health and motivating people to perform their exercises, could be, uh, could be physiology and so forth, that's what we need. We need to keep the patients in the zone so that they are motivated to do the exercises and that no matter what the challenges are ahead, they keep, they stick to it. So, um, now, you can use video games for a lot of different applications. There is a nice quote as well that I like. What it explains is that video games can be seen the same as any other medium, like video, audio, and so forth. So, like the protected books, plays, and movies that preceded them, video games communicate ideas and even social messages through many familiar liter literary devices and through features distinctive to the medium. So, the idea that you can use video games now the same way as you use Video, audio, books. It's a major, and you have to use it as such. Okay. Before we used to, I mean, maybe 20, 30 years ago, we consider video games just as 
just as you, just as a, something in, in, in separation or something in isolation. There are games you can use game to teach or to raise awareness the same as you will use a video or a viral video for instance online. So in this game for instance, have you heard about that for a day? Some of you will have already. Okay. The idea is that this game was um, published by a, game, a website called Games for Change. This website publishes video games just to change people's behaviors, to change their state of mind about different things. It could be a social issue, for instance. It could be health. It could be anything. The idea is just to shift um, the opinion and just to bring awareness to specific problems. In this one, for instance, therefore is dying, you get to understand the, the difficulty faced by people who are in the refugee camps. I think it's a very good game, not only because of the gameplay, but also because of the emotions that you feel when you play the game. It's quite hard, it's quite difficult. When I do some workshops and I ask teachers to play these games, the first thing is, well, it's, it's quite difficult, especially if you know about the situation. Uh, let's say, for instance, in this, in, in this episode, um, uh, a young girl is, as she has to bring some water, uh, she has to go to the well, get some water, and bring it back to the camp. The, the problem is that she can be captured by the militia. So, when you play this video again, you get to understand how it seems to live there and how it feels to live there. Now, you can play this game online if you want, it's free. Just Google uh, that for a day, you can find it straight away. Now, in terms of video games, what, what is actually helping you guys as well, in terms of, for you, from the health sector, or people who are developing video games, is that there is uh, what is called democratization of video game development. You have a few game engines that are available out there. Um, I know at the back here you've used Unity 3D, is that correct? Yes. Unity 3D. Uh, you have other uh, game, what is called, what are called game engine, that actually allow you to create video games in a much easier way than it used to be a few years ago. So you have a lot of different uh, support for creating video games, game engines, modes, what are called multi-user virtual models. The last one here is very important for people who work in hospitals, but it actually it tends to very facilitate collaborative learning. Uh, you can work in teams, for instance, and get to work on your hard skills, but also your soft skills. So I'm going to give some example later on. So game engines, for those of you who don't know what games are, they are software that helps you to create video games with no or little experience in game programming. Does it make sense? Yes? Okay. So what you need to do for this game engine is just to drag and drop. That's all you need to do, but you don't need to code. Okay, so for those of you who wanted to know a bit more about it, but you don't know how to go about creating a video game, that could be a start. So uh, there is a game maker, which is a very basic game engine. You can use it to create 2D games, so that 3D as well, and it's built for 3D. And then you can move to Unity 3D, which is a video game that can create a game engine that can create video games online. So you can actually visualize them in the browser. For this one, you will need a bit of problem. Okay, but what it does is just facilitates the development process. So there is a game here called Power of Research Hospital. Have you heard about this game before? Yes? No? Okay, you've seen it before. I'm gonna try to click on that and so what I do is just leave it there, and uh, I leave it on my on my on my side, and you may be able to, to download it. So you have uh, different um, games online that you can use. Uh, the first one is with Power Research Hospital. It was designed using Unity 3D, and in this uh, video game, you are um, uh, just a doctor, and you're trying to evaluate or to assess the the, the condition of different patients. Perhaps as well, it's quite a good game. And uh, of course, to play video games, you can use mods as well. So mods are modification of existing games. And one of the last things you can do is multi-user environment. So um, in this case, have you heard about Second Life before? Second Life? OK, have you gone on Second Life? And no. no? OK. Okay. So the first thing I will advise you to do, if you don't know about games, just go on Second Life. OK, it's free. As a, as a user, it's free. So create an account. Go on Second Life. And you have a lot of simulations out there. Um, you can be, uh, so you can create any type of character that you need or you want. And you can 
just go into this virtual environment. Some of them are for medical purposes, so uh, for nursing, uh, surgery, and so forth. So I would advise you just to go there and have a look at it. Now, Second Life, if you wanted to just visit Second Life, you need to press that on, it's free. But if you want to create a virtual in Second Life, you will need to buy some land. Right? That's, that's the problem. Well, that's the problem of the, uh, the cash. For open source options, or free options, there is a software called OpenSIM, which is the same as Second Life, but it's free. Okay? But you need to install it on your server. So if you wanted to know a bit more about it, uh, just go for OpenSIM and Second Life, and you should be able to know more about it. Um, now, again, just to give you some information, there is a game called Clean Space. It's a multi user uh, virtual environment system and it's for healthcare. And it just helps them to know a bit more about different procedures. And it's used both for hard skills, such as technical skills, but also for soft skills, so communication and so forth. So, those environments are very useful for that as well. Okay, so that's the link. This presentation, by the way, will be online, so you can download it and go to the link if you want later. Okay, this is a video on YouTube on, 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 the, on the software. Right, now I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, you can do as long as you want because. As long as you want. Well, I'll be maximum another half hour. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. No. I won't be that long, but. Um, okay, so from that now, at this stage, if you were, if you don't know anything about video games, you should you should know a bit more about it. And what I want to show you is that there is an increasing adoption of games only right now. Um, in schools, we use video games to teach about mathematics, physics, biology, and so forth. Uh, we use them with a master degree in serious game in Sweden. We have funding from the European Council. In the US, we're investing a lot also in, in game based learning, so it's, it's an increasing influence. And in terms of health, you have several games that have been created for in game based learning uh, to train staff, to raise awareness uh, about uh, different issues such, such as cancer, for instance, obesity, diet, and so forth, to relax patients, to help the recovery process, and for what is called post traumatic stress. Um, now, just to give you some, some pointers for those who are actually studying in the area. Um, there have, some, there have been some video games in, to, for different purposes. The first one is um, to fight obesity and boost physical activity. Now, did you ever use the Nintendo Wii or Wii Fit? Yes, okay. So, in this case, you might have those, uh, you have some experiments who have used the Nintendo Wii Fit or even Dance Dance Revolution, have you played that already? Okay, so this is Dance Mask when you have, you can see these people doing crazy moves. And um, basically the idea is that those games now, which are mainstream, are used to improve health and to, pro to, to promote a healthy diet and healthy behaviors. Now, gamification. Have you heard about gamification before? Okay. What's the idea of gamification, if you have an idea? Yeah. So, I need to uh, take game design principles to the outer world, to the uh, yeah. outside of games, and to um, achieve a high motivation, for example. That's it. Pledge some Foursquare when you visit a, a local. Uh, That's it. That's it. So, this is just to show you that game based learning is not only about digital video games. You can also apply games principle to a non digital format. Okay? The idea is to give reward, to motivate people, but just basically to engage them a little bit more, but just using the game mechanics. Um, now, to raise awareness, obviously, uh, there are different things that will help game based learning. The first thing is you have money channel distributions. Now, if you have an iPad, for instance, you can use and find actually healthy video games or healthy video games on the, on the, on the Apple Store. Um, you can also have different type of platform for video games. You have the Wii Fit, Kinect, tablet, tablet, tablet tablets. Uh, in terms of gender or disabilities, people with impaired vision or reduced mobility. For instance, there was a study in the UK recently showing that actually Wii Fit can be also the Nintendo Wii can also be used for people who have impaired vision. It provides some cues, especially auditory cues, that actually enable them or our make it possible for them to play this type of video games. So video games are getting a bit, a bit more inclusive and especially for health, I think it's a, it's a good point, it's something we could use as well. Um, 
Okay, now what I wanted to show you is just an example of a really good video game to motivate later for with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a, it's a paper uh, that was written by Albright et al. And the idea was that uh, veterans after the war, uh, some of them actually had some uh, problems, so some post-traumatic disorders. And the idea is that many of them didn't know they had this issue. They didn't actually, they couldn't self-diagnose themselves. So, what the researcher did, they developed the software. Uh, first thing, the software developed by a multidisciplinary team, which means that you have people who are doctors and people who are game developers. They just go together, the same way as you did today. And this game was a role-playing game. Okay? So, a role-playing game is a, play where, uh, a game where you, you, you are in the shoe of, um, of the person A or B or C. The idea is that you can see the problem from different perspectives. And the third, the third thing is that it uses emotionally responsive characters. So I think emotions, as we said before, are very important. And in this example, the, the characters show emotions, anger and so forth. So it's something important. And you have something like 94 participants, totally assigned to both uh, control and experimental groups. And what we showed is what we see in this example. The first thing that it increased the veterans' preparedness and likelihood to seek for help. So after playing the video games, all many of these veterans decided to go and look for help. That's the first thing. The second point is that it increased the likelihood to discuss concern with peers. They are more open to discuss about their problem with the peers, family and friends. The third point, family members now were more motivated to actually encourage the veterans to seek for help. And the last point is that it increased the number of veterans who began to receive treatment. So I think this is quite an interesting study, just to show you can actually use video games to change behaviors and to promote learning as well. So just to let you know. At the end of this presentation, what I will do as well, I will give you a link to different journals you can go to if you want to have more information about different studies on this topic. And now, um, few other researchers. Baranowski, you might have those doing masters of research, you might have come across his name. Yes, maybe, maybe not. And Lieberman. Uh, if you look at those guys, they've done a lot of study about video games and health, and they found the following that using video games, you can basically treat or at least improve some of these issues diet, physical activity, asthma, um, and voluntary airway clearance activities for children with cystic fibrosis and the validation after a stroke. So you can actually use, or you can use video games for a lot of different options. I think there is a lot of research that has been done in this area, but of course we need to research more. Now, if you wanted to know more about game-based learning, uh, of course there are good publications uh, on the topic, and here are some uh, places where you can know more about it. The first thing is the European Conference on Game Based Learning. It's every year. It's a European conference. You okay there? Okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> and the, 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 you have Games for Change, Games for Health. You have the IT, uh, the IIT SEC, which is basically a conference on uh, simulations, and some of them apply to healthcare. And the last one is the Sales Game Showcase Challenge, which every year gives a prize of the most innovative and effective uh, video games. Uh, for children, really. Journals again, there is a, yeah, a very good journal about games for health. Okay, so I just left the link right there. It's a new journal, I think it's just started this year, but you have a great, good few uh, articles about games and health. It's really dedicated to that. The International Journal of Game Based Learning, again, it's about game based learning, with some of the issues are for health. Simulation gaming, and of course, the International Journal of Gaming and Contributing Simulation. So, you have a lot of resources out there. So, if you don't know about game based learning, this is where you can go. This is where you can find information about it. You don't need to take the notes because those will be available on the website. So, you can have it there. Okay? Now, if you wanted to know more about, uh, if you wanted to get some more information, you have a mailing list. There is the DIGRA Association. Again, if you subscribe to this mailing list, uh, it's a list with researchers on the topic of game, uh, video games and some of them are game based learning. And there is a special uh, interest group as well for the IGDA, IGDA that you might want to subscribe to as well. So again, if you want to know more about games and learning, that's where you should go. Now, 
Uh, yeah, low flat size and gain on motivation, but I don't want to go through it because it's quite long. Uh, instead, what I want to do is leave that for you on the website. And the last topic I just want to go through is there is a topic that we don't really talk about that much in terms of game development and game design. The idea of addictions and violence in games. Okay, do I raise some eyebrows there? Okay. The idea, okay. There are quite a few papers out there, and I just want to, to, to go for that briefly with you. Do you think that. Okay, okay, sorry, so as you can see, there are a good few of them, but I won't go through them again. Okay, gaming and addiction should be ignored. So, do you think we should talk about it, and what do you think? Do you think there is an addiction problem, or there could be an addiction problem? I just want to have a little forum here and just discuss about it. Because in issues, we don't talk about that much, and I think we really need to have actually a bit of uh, transparency about this topic. So, yeah? Well, there are clinical institutions who help people who have a real addiction problem yeah. with media of any kind, yeah. especially games. Yes. Um, so there's no doubt it is there. Okay, okay. I'll say this point. So, um, Anyone else want to talk about it? Yeah? yeah I heard from, from one of those clinics that uh, um, it's not a real gaming addiction often, but often an addiction, for example, uh, for social context. That uh, yeah. people looking for social context and uh, go, to, uh, go into gaming to, to find those social contexts in MMORPGs, for example. So uh, gaming addiction is often a substitute for, for other addictions or necessary. Uh, okay. okay, so we're getting there, okay? No, no, what you're saying is totally correct. You have some people can have a gaming addiction, but sometimes they have more than a gaming addiction. There is something called more comorbidity, you might be familiar with the term, is that people who are addicted to video games are usually addicted to other things as well. Could be gambling, could be anything. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to come to that later. Any other ideas about addiction and games? Yeah? I think the game has to be addictive. Uh, if the game is good and it's fun, uh, it's addictive. Another point as well that I recover. So you see that games should be addictive. That's true. I think one of the issues that we have is that people who have major addiction, sometimes they thought they were major addiction, but what they measured was high level of engagement. Okay, but I agree with what you're saying. Any other point? Addiction games? No more ideas. Okay, so let me cover that with you. The first thing is that some stereotypes prevail with educators as to possible gaming addiction. I think there could be addictions, but as we see, as we will see, they cannot be all um, explained by just by video games. It is essential to educate trainers so that they can prevent and identify the behaviors, but the big thing is transparency is the key. One of the problems why we can't get game into school sometimes is that teachers or lecturers think that Games can be too addictive, people will just forget about their homework and so forth, and they don't want them to play video games. So let's see how we can actually look at this. First, some players may be committed to video games. That's the great. That's the great. But it is essential to make this section between high level of engagement and addiction. I think that's what we were saying here. So we want people to be highly engaged in video games. But sometimes, when people actually did their study and try to measure addiction, one they measured was high level of engagement, but not addiction. And there is literature to back it up, so I can give you references if you want to. The, the, the third point is addiction usually heightened, is backed by lack of supervision. If you look at children, for instance, some children might be addicted to video games because parents or peers do not make enough time for them to, or to organize their time for us. Sorry. The parents might not have organized their time in a way that allows for other activities, such as physical activities, meeting friends, meeting family, and so forth. And sometimes they get into game because, um, because they're not supervised. The fourth point is that addiction can cause withdrawal from social activities, disrupted sleep patterns, less time to get to homework. That's also a point. And the last part is that addiction can be prevented and corrected if proper actions are taken and a healthy lifestyle is followed. So what the literature says is that it's all down to um, very simple measures. Now, addiction is usually a symptom rather than the cause. So there is no established causality between addiction to video games and violent behaviors, if you look at violence. What people find is a link. So they might find a link between people playing video games and people being violent, but it doesn't mean that one is causing the other. 
it's a leak. There is no causality. And that's the main problem the lecturer, the literature has at the moment, is that there is no causality. There could be links or correlation, if you prefer, but there is no causality. So that's something that we, we have to keep an eye out. And uh, poor results and attention deficit may cause attraction to games. Some players are labeled as addictive, although they may not have an addictive problem. And the last thing is there is significant comorbidity to addictions. So people who are addicted to video games, in fact, might be addicted to a lot of other different things. So it's something that we have to keep in mind as well. So as you can see, it's not a simple problem. We have to look at it from different angles and look at all the different variables. You can't label someone as addicted, uh, addicted if you're not using the right scale. You can't really talk to someone, say that someone is addicted, when well, actually in fact this person is just showing a high level of engagement. And now, what are the cause of addiction according to uh, the literature? The first thing is that some people are called sensation seekers, so they're actually looking for high sensations and their inclination to boredom, for instance. Players environments, so lack of blind, leisure time, companionship or supervision. And game mechanics. So actually, as you somewhat, one of you said, for instance, uh, some games can be very addictive or highly engaged. And the reason is that you have curiosity, rewards, and also people are very attached to their character. Okay, so it can happen. In fact, um, some game developers have been criticized for that. And they have been asked also to put mechanisms in place to restrict addictive behaviors and possible, uh, possible addictive behaviors. So, there is a good bit of work going in this area. So, as I said, to prevent addiction, it's really always down to moderation and common sense. And what we really need to do is to educate teachers, lecturers, but also people who will use the video game, obviously. And the last bit is that communication between youth, parents, and instructors should be increased. So, um, I think that's it. I just want to tackle this issue because it's something that we don't really talk about generally. So I'm going to end up this, uh, this keynote in about a few seconds. The last thing I want to do is that today is a fantastic opportunity for you, doctors, surgeons, nurses, game designers, game developers, and researchers to get together, to learn from each other, and not to repeat the mistakes of the past. 20, 30 years ago, we have good video games, a lot of video games, some of them called um, what is it? entertainment. Okay, or edu no, edutainment, sorry. And the problem that these video games were certainly educational, but were not motivating. And the main issue was that there was no discussion between educators and game developers. So today, you have the opportunity, game developers, to talk to the educators, the professional, and professional, you have the, you have the opportunity to talk to game developers. So I hope that you get much uh, from this conference, I would invite you to discuss with developers, designers, and so forth. And these slides will be online, so I would just suggest that you have a look at it. There are good few references if you want to look at them. Now, if you want to contact me after this conference, okay, just to show you here, uh, this is my email address. If you want to drop an email and talk about game based learning, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. I'm on Twitter as well. Who's on Twitter here? Twitter? Okay. Guys, get on Twitter if you can. Okay. It's free. And uh, it's quite interesting just to get uh, up to date with different events uh, about game based learning. It's very good. Uh, it can be addictive at times, I, I agree. But it's very interesting, very informative as well. And I have a blog as well if you want to, to have a look at it. It's called Patrick Felicia at WordPress.com. On this blog, I've got resources for developers, practitioners, and so forth. Uh, I've got a list of publications that you might be able to look at if you want to, if you want to look at uh, different um, positive aspects of video games for learning. And uh, last but not least, I've got a journal, so as I said, the International Journal of Game Based Learning. So uh, based on this presentation, on, on this, on this uh, conference, some of you might consider submitting their publication or their presentation in the form of a paper to the journal. And again, if you want to visit me or us in Ireland uh, this year, we'll have a conference in June. And the conference in October, we'll be talking about video games, learning, training, engaging. Okay, so thank you very much for that, and I hope to see you around and talk to you about the Thank you.